Hi everyone, Victor Timely here with Rhyme Signatures, the nerdiest music review this side of giving a whole new look and feel to freshly spun spaghetti. And today we're going to be doing a review of the new Closure in Moscow album, Soft Hell. Making a dramatic comeback after being away for what feels like forever is such a common thing in the music industry nowadays that it's almost not particularly shocking anymore. Ever since Tool finally decided to break the silence following the 13-year wait between 10,000 Days and Fear Inoculum, the thought of a band taking a long hiatus simply hasn't been as dread-inducing anymore. Because frankly, if Tool could finally get off their lazy butts and make a new album, then so could anyone. Which points us neatly at Melbourne-based progressive rock quintet Closure in Moscow, who've been keeping their fans waiting nine long years now for a follow-up to their controversial sophomore album Pink Lemonade. And much like Tool's Faithful, the fans never lost hope that eventually their darlings would return and hopefully make the extended twiddling of the thumbs all worth it. Now, I find that these sort of extended breaks are extremely risky things for a band to undertake as you have to acknowledge and realise that when you're pushing towards 10 years in between records, the chances are not only extremely high that your own abilities, playing styles, compositions, ideas, attitudes and whatnot towards making music are likely to be vastly different, and the people who championed you 10 years ago might have gotten bored, moved past you, found something new, different and exciting that filled that gap, and now view your return as an irrelevant footnote in their own personal histories. Case in point, Tool. In the interim between 10,000 Days and Fear Inoculum, we've had records like Carnival's Sound Awake, Richelieu's Living as Ghosts with Buildings as Teeth, Vulcan's Technatura, Lucid Planets 2, the list goes on. When Tool slept, the progressive rock and metal world answered this silence by filling it with bands who did what they did and arguably did it better. It made the band's return feel hollow, a little empty and far less thrilling than it should have been, and ultimately resulted in a record that, for me at least, felt a bit too little too late. So what does that mean for Closure in Moscow? Has the band waited too long and has their niche been filled? Should they have maintained their silence, gone their separate ways and started new projects rather than reviving this old dinosaur? Let's take a little journey as we review their long-awaited third studio album, Soft Hell. For those who aren't familiar with the band and haven't been keeping up, the lineup currently consists of Christopher de Sank on lead vocals, Mansur Zanelli on guitars and backing vocals, Michael Barrett also on guitars, Salvatore Adeon on drums, and Duncan Miller on bass. The former three representing the remaining OG members, and the latter two having joined the band just prior to the release of Pink Lemonade. The band's style is easy to summarise, but hard to detail. Brass tacks, you're looking at a kind of indie-fused pop rock with progressive tendencies and ideas. Think a less jazzy Thank You Scientist or a poppier Deer Hunter, and somewhere in between that, you'll have a pretty good idea of what to expect from Closure in Moscow. The band's debut album, First Temple, remains their magnum opus, and for me is unquestionably one of the best indie prog albums of all time, and the main reason why I've maintained hype and faith in this band is due to the strength of that album. The follow-up, Pink Lemonade, was quite different, and it certainly managed to divide the fanbase's opinions, with one half finding it a little bit too weird, and the other celebrating the strangeness. Now, I'll admit I kind of fall somewhere in the middle, bit of a cop-out, I know, and I kind of enjoy its quirks, but ultimately I always find myself yearning for more of that first temple vibe. So where does that leave soft hell? Well, this certainly isn't more of the same of Pink Lemonade, but nor is it really much of a throwback to first temple. Soft Hell does, however, feel like a kind of natural progression of the band's sound, but also feels quite distinct, melodic, and honestly really quite catchy and immediate, which makes for an easy record to appreciate at face value. But I do personally think it lacks some of the nuance and staying power of what they've made prior to this. Now, make no mistake, I've ultimately had a pretty good time with this album. There are some incredibly fun, engaging, and interesting things going on across the 50 minutes that the band has us for, but I can't help but maintain the nagging doubt that there's something in the ingredients that isn't sticking for me. There's a certain je ne sais quoi that is holding me back from wanting to gush about the good parts without applying a certain caveat to them. I mean, let's look at the opening track, Jaeger Bomb. 
things start quite interestingly with an almost off-key discordance to the melody and then segueing into a thick, funky, danceable groove. But then there's this kind of cringy double gunshot sound effect following on from some questionable lyricism feeling a little bit 14-year-old edgelord at times. Everything that I kill, it's my own free will. Like, I mean, come on. It's just not doing it for me, which is a genuine shame as the actual grooves and melodies on this opening track are really pretty damn good. Primal Sinister is a much better follow-up, showcasing some driving power, giving off Queens of the Stone Age vibes with a chunky, fuzzy bass tone snaking underneath the discordant and aggressive guitars. I feel like I've travelled back to the early 2000s where bands like Franz Ferdinand and the Kaiser Chiefs ruled the airwaves, and it feels like a delicious slice of retro indie rock, and I keep coming back to this one time and time again. Third track, Absolute Terror Field, is a song of yes, 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 no, 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 with some kind of out-of-the-place modern R&B style opening vocals and instrumentation that completely sets off my own personal red flags, and a pre-chorus melody that keeps making me think of some vocal lines from the Darkwing Duck theme tune. It's just not something I really enjoy that much, causing me to have a case of tonal whiplash between DeSang's impeccable vocal performance being offset by melodies and grooves that just don't sit right on my own palate. Sadly, I just flat out ended up disliking this song and skipped it quite regularly. Better Way is a much more palatable song for me and a well-deserving lead single for the album, firing off some incredible jams, a fist-pumping chorus and showcasing some absolutely wild instrumentation, particularly on the drums, with some off-kilter fills and intricate patterns being thrown into the mix near constantly, but managing to still find its footing as one of the most accessible feeling and mainstream surfing songs on the album. It's a great time and a fantastic way to introduce people to the band if they're not sure what vibe they're giving. Fifth track, Holy Rush, is a great showcase for DeSang's vocal talent, with some incredibly raw, soaring and powerful moments, pushing his larynx out there and advertising to the world that he's got one of the singular strongest set of pipes on the scene right now. He sounded like a cross between Einar Solberg and Casey Crescenzo at times here, coming across as an indie rock version of Leprous on several occasions on this song. Now it makes me yearn for a duet between DeSank and Solberg, and who knows, maybe they'll tour together sometime and make this dream a reality for me. Keeper of the Lake is another solid, groove-laden track, the band showcasing their restraint and melodic chops admirably here, slipping in little flourishes of their raw talent here and there, but never overtaking their own ambitions. There's a lesson to be learnt from this song, that you can be technical and showy without being completely full-on. The moments of instrumental virtuosity are brief and tasteful, and it makes for a song that feels like it's constantly running along a knife edge, blue-balling the listener constantly, but, you know, in a really good way. It's also the longest song on the album, and really does allow for a great amount of expressive playing from everyone involved, and it is an easy favourite for me. Seventh track, Lock and Key, slows things down a little bit, with a more intimate, gentle, and introspective approach to the instrumentation, allowing for down-tempo guitar noodling, soothing grooves, and all kind of lounge jazzy vocals. It's a great song, and certainly arrives at the right time in the album's flow, giving the listener a chance to chill out a little from the intensity of the first half of the album. The latter side of the record carries on with Don Juan Triumphant, another slightly more stripped down and minimalist song, and while it's still a wonderful showcase for DeSang's powerful vocals, it's ultimately a largely unmemorable song for me, never quite finding its place amongst the rest of the album. It's a good song, sure, but there's just something about it which doesn't quite click for me. The back half of the song is a lot more my vibe though, but ultimately this is another song I found myself glossing over on repeated listens. The title track of Soft Hell, though, is where the band comes roaring back in and demanding I stop goofing off and pay attention to them. This is easily my favourite song on the whole album and the one I've listened to the most independently of spinning the record in full. I love the delicate, plaintive intro, the lyrics are fantastic, the vocal performance exquisite, and the catchiness of the driving groove at around the 1 minute 20 mark is so full of joy and positivity that it can make me forgive the few tracks on here that didn't quite work for me. At just over the 3 minutes mark, the feel like I'm dreaming all of the time part is absolutely delightful and sends shivers up and down my spine every time I hear it. A top tier song not only for the album, but for the band in general. Unfortunately, the following song of Fine is, well, precisely that. It's 
fine. It's one of the shorter cuts on the album, but I just don't feel it does anything nearly interesting enough for me to want to revisit or re-listen to it outside of spinning the album in full for completion's sake. It's not a bad song, it's just kind of there for me, feeling like it's going through the motions and existing as a Frankenstein of cutting room floor parts. Just Sank's unbelievable voice almost saves it for me though, but it just feels too much like so many other parts of the album, resulting in a song that kind of vibes existing for the sake of it. But in classic Seesaw style, Closure in Moscow then fires up Love Lash and rekindles my passions and excitement once again. From the instant 80s groove that kicks off the song, to the toe-tapping melodies and fist-bumping scream-it-to-the-sky chorus, to the cheesy, neon-coloured bridging instrumentation, it's impossible not to fall head over heels for this track, and it remains a powerful, incredibly affecting closing number that the band should be very proud of and makes the nine-year wait almost feel worth it. Except that's not the end of the album. Despite how perfectly this would have closed things off, we for some reason have what I consider to be the weakest track on the album have the dubious honour of ending the record. My dearest Kate feels so completely out of place compared to the rest of the album, opting for a much rawer, more lo-fi production style, being primarily driven by DeSanc's plaintive vocals with minimal instrumentation backing him up, with nothing but a simple guitar line to guide him. I think this will work better in a live setting, as it's still a great performance, but it just feels like a tacked-on bonus track, especially when you consider how strongly the album would have otherwise ended on Love Lash. So, what else can I say about Closure in Moscow's Soft Hell? I'd obviously been anticipating this one with a certain kind of nervous trepidation, given how much I'd appreciated their existing records prior to this one, and I can honestly say that while I've had a good time with this one overall, for me personally, it hasn't quite met the hype I'd built up in my own head. Yes, it's a good record. At times, it's a great record. But there's some tracks on here that I either don't much care for or actively find myself skipping, which is honestly quite disappointing for me, given how much I've enjoyed this band's output to this point. No, there's nothing on here I actively dislike and nothing I go as far as saying is objectively bad. It's just that there's a few slightly sour apples amongst this otherwise burgeoning orchard. Where Soft Hell is good, it's very good. Everyone sounds fantastic, the songwriting is rock solid, the production immaculate, and by and large it's an easily digestible, rollicking good time from start to finish. Now I'm certain that your mileage may vary on the songs that did nothing for me, but that's the beauty of music and the beauty of forming your own opinions, as ultimately this is just how I personally feel about the album. Now I can envisage this record being a lot more appealing for newcomers to the band, who haven't had any expectations set by their first two offerings, and I sincerely hope that this record brings the band a whole new audience, and we aren't waiting another nine years for whatever comes next. Ultimately, I would still pick up a digital copy of this one. Where it shines, it shines bright as the sun, and frankly I could listen to DeSanc read me the yellow pages and still be enraptured by his voice. It's just a little bit patchy in places that could have been resolved for me by a little bit of trimming, perhaps bringing this down to like, I don't know, a 38 to 40-ish minute record. This, of course, guys, is all just my opinion, as you know, so if you have listened to Soft Hell, please tell me what you thought about this record in the comments down below. If you did like this video, please do share it with anyone else who you think would possibly enjoy it, and please do consider subscribing to the channel for more content. I'm going to leave my link tree down below, where you'll find all the places to find me on social media, as well as a link to my coffee page if you're feeling particularly generous and want to help support the growth of the channel. But until next time, guys, as always, keep your rhyme signatures extremely odd.